right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from sunny San Diego. And today I am delighted to welcome Dr. Tim Sharp, who is in Sydney, Australia. How are you doing, Dr. Tim? Hey, great. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, and I'm really excited to talk to, I've never talked to uh, doc, a person who's known as Dr. Happy before. And uh, let's face it, I mean, we would all love to have a Dr. Happy around for ourselves. And uh, uh, Dr. Tim has been at the forefront of positives, the positive psychology movement and the founder of the Happiness Institute. So um, let, let's start out and we're going to talk today about positive psychology and happiness. But uh, let, let's just uh, kind of baseline this. When you talk about the positive psychology movement what is that yeah look uh, that's a good question good place to start um and I, I guess i can explain it by explaining my background so i started mm -hmm. out in clinical psychology as a clinical psychologist and, and an academic and clinical psychology is what most people think of i guess when they think of psychology it's uh, uh i was a therapist so we were mostly focusing on the assessment and treatment of things like depression and anxiety yeah. and stress and I guess that's what most people think about, um, you know, when they think about psychologists. But uh, about 20 years ago or so, um, a number of psychologists started to sort of ask the question. They said, look, for so long, we've been focusing on what's wrong with people and how can we fix it? Uh, what if we were to ask what's right with people and how can we make the most of that? And so at the risk of oversimplifying, uh, the, the positive psychology movement was born. And what that really involved was the shift from an exclusive focus on problems and deficits and how to overcome that to a more balanced approach that started to include strengths and attributes and successes and how we can uh, leverage that for happiness and thriving and flourishing. So that's where that's the difference there. And positive psychology is essentially the science of thriving and flourishing. Yeah, that, that's that's great. And, and it is really interesting because I think as, as humans, we're almost hardwired uh, to look at the deficits and to look at the problems. I mean, you even see in co corporations when people do performance reviews, they normally go, oh, here, Tim, here's a couple of things that you're doing really well. Now here's my list of 50 things that you need to improve on. And we always go there. And, and you're right. I mean, we associate clinical psychology or psychology with it's something that you go, you take notice of when you have a when you have a problem or an issue or as deficit, as you say, not something to build upon the strengths that you may have. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, it, it, you're hundred percent right, and it's a big problem in a lot of workplaces, uh, which is where I do most of my work now. Um, mm. You know, trying to build help help organisations and teams build positive cultures, and and yeah, yeah definitely. The, you know, the, the average uh, performance review. Uh, tends to focus on quote unquote areas of improvement, which is really just a euphemism for you know where you're stuffing up, I guess. <laughs> um, now I should say that that's not completely inappropriate. You know, if if someone's underperforming or not performing well, if they need to learn something, then fantastic. You know, if we can identify those areas and improve, uh, that's a form of self development, which is a good thing. But it shouldn't ever be exclusively that, because you know, for every, every one of us has areas we can improve, but we also have. Uh, strengths, psychological strengths. And really what the best organizations do, what the best managers do is uh, they're much more aware of their people's strengths and they're much better at helping their people, helping their staff to use those strengths. And what we know is if you can do that, you perform a lot better. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree with you more. We actually follow the the uh, Friedman Malik uh, management philosophy here. And one of those things <laughs> is your know, focus on strengths. And and I think that is that does lead to a more positive experience of you, you know, rather than saying here, Tim, here's things you're not good at. Why don't I look at the things that Tim is really good at and give him more of that to do? And, you know, because often you're never going to I mean, there are some things. Yeah, maybe there are some parts of your job you need to improve because you have to do. But there's some things maybe that you're never going to be good at. So why put that stress on? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think that's another common mistake that some of us make, not just well, in the workplace, but in other areas of our life is mm -hmm. trying to be fantastic at everything. Um, and we yeah. can't, you know, I think sometimes we need to accept we'll only ever be average in certain areas. Uh, and that's OK. Um, and it's better to focus on where we can be exceptional. Um, as long as those other areas aren't uh, disrupting us or causing us problems, that's when we do need to sort of fix them or at least manage them. But yeah, look, the research is very clear in in our personal lives and our working lives, that the more we identify and focus on what we're best at, the better we can be, the happier we are, uh, the, the better we perform. 
so when you when you work with people in organizations, how do you start to get them to focus on more more positive things? Because you know, we're as I said, we're hardwired to be fairly negative. There's a lot of negative self-talk. I think the psychology today had it something like 70% of our self-talk every day is is negative or something like that. But how do you help people start to reorient their thinking so to focus more on, on the positive? Um, yeah, so look, you're right. Uh, there's certainly some good evidence to suggest that we are sort of hardwired um, to focus on threat that I guess, you know, if you think about yeah. it from an evolutionary perspective, that was a useful thing. If we looked out for threat and danger, we were more likely to survive. Um, and so some of that still uh, remains with us, you know, that certain parts of our brains haven't changed for hundreds or sorry, thousands of thousands of years, I guess. Um, so there is this negativity bias, what psychologists talk about. Um, but the good thing about uh, the modern brain and the modern human is that we can override that. Um, you know, there are some sort of base aspects of our brain uh, that go back thousands of years uh, but we don't have to be, um, you know, a prisoner to those things. So we can, uh, I guess the answer to your question is one of the first things is mindfulness or, or psychological awareness. So uh, once we're aware of that and once we're aware of the consequences, which is you know, not always easy, um, but, you know, it's a skill. And like any other skill, the more you practice it, the better you get. And once we're more aware or mindful of some of that, uh, you know, so that negativity bias, we can start to practice other skills or, or overlay other strategies uh, that can tend uh, draw us more towards the positive. So, um, you know, it, it starts with the mindfulness, with, a, with an awareness, and then it starts with practicing a more positive focus that can come through the practice of gratitude and appreciation. It can come through actively looking for good things in ourselves and in the world more generally. Um, so, you know, it depends. Uh, every engagement I have with organizations is different. Uh, sometimes sure. it's really just a you know, a one-off keynote that explains some of these things like we're doing today. Uh, oftentimes, it'll be a series of those things, maybe with, with deeper workshops where we can get more into the, you know, deep and meaningful activities that uh, build these skills. Um, but yeah, that, that's my ultimate goal, I suppose, is to help people become more aware of what's going on, uh, what's working and what's not working, and how they can do more good stuff to feel better. Right. Yeah, and and on the on the subject of mindfulness and and self awareness, these are things that are can be difficult for people. I I personally believe that lack of self awareness or lack of mindfulness is probably one of the greatest inhibitors to progress in your career, to happiness in your personal life. But it's it's not that easy, or or people shy away from doing that kind of self-awareness self-discovery because it can be it can be difficult because you have to kind of admit things to yourself yeah no, I, I, I totally agree with the first bit you said that it's uh, you know it's one of the m m most common uh, reasons why people aren't as happy and successful as they could be um and i guess you know that my, my um explanation of that I guess, is that um we, we, we don't learn it um you know so often our, if our parents don't know it um through no fault of their own they can't mm -hmm. necessarily teach us um, unfortunately, it's not taught in the schools or not very much. There's, there's actually better than it used to be. So there are some school programs that start to touch on some of these things, which is fantastic. I, I think there should be a lot more of it. I think we should be teaching our kids this. Uh, it's just as important as teaching them maths and science and all the other things. Um, because imagine if, you know, if our kids learn psychological awareness or mindfulness when they were young, imagine how, how that would set them up for a better life. Um, but, but you're right, you know, we don't learn these things often when we're young, so it is a bit more difficult. But that being said, in my experience anyway, I think a lot of people uh, you know, would love to learn it. They're keen to, they just don't know where to start. And I guess that's where I come in and people like me come in um, uh, is just giving them the, the basic, some basic skills to get started on it. Once you do get started, you're right, it can be difficult because if we become psychologically aware or mindful, we might become aware of some negative traits of some mistakes we're making of some aspects of ourselves that we don't necessarily like. But if it's done in the right way, and if you approach it with, uh, there's another concept, which um, you're probably familiar with called a growth mindset, uh, the idea that we can change, we can be better. This isn't who we are forever necessarily. So if we encourage people to think about it like that, then even identifying some of the more negative aspects isn't entirely a bad thing. It's just where we are now, but we can be different or better tomorrow. Yeah, I, I think it's, yeah, absolutely. And I think it's important that people realize that life is a journey. It's, uh, and during that journey, you know, you evolve and grow. And that's why I think, yeah, the growth mindset is, 
is particularly is particularly critical. Uh, so how does how would you advise someone to start on the path of maybe becoming a little bit more mindful or becoming a little bit more self-aware or, or developing a, a kind of growth mindset? What would be the starting points? Well, look, to be honest, the great thing now is that it's actually quite easy. I mean, compared to when I started out, if you look at now, the, the availability of resources in this area is uh, well, it's massive. I mean, there's, there's a lot of great resources available, a lot of them available for free, too. Um, so, you know, for example, if we look at mindfulness, there are hundreds of apps you can download uh, or free, you know, free resources on YouTube, etc. Um, uh, what I usually say to people is um, you know, there's none, none of them are necessarily right or wrong or good or bad. There's just there's different styles. Um, and so it's just up to each and every one of us to try and find a style uh, that we like, that you know, that resonates with us. So, so I definitely encourage people to you know go and try a couple of different forms of mindfulness. Um, you know, sometimes it just comes down to the person's accent or the way they speak. And again, it doesn't mean they're wrong, but if, if, if you don't like it, it, it can be um, you know it might not work for you. So, so try a couple of them out, see which one works for you. Then, when you find something that you kind of like, um, stick to it, practice it. Uh, because again, it really is a skill that requires practice. Um, and the more you practice it, the better you get. Um, there's also, you know, there's all sorts of fantastic um, books and audio books, depending on whether you're a reader or a listener, fantastic podcasts. So, um, you know, again, I just encourage people to explore the wonderful resources that are available or, you know, find the websites, find the uh, Instagram pages or whatever of people who work in this area. Um, you know, there's a lot of people doing similar stuff to what I do uh, and follow them, um, you know, because again, a lot of them post free stuff that you can, uh, that you can sort of pick up on a daily basis and start gradually to uh, integrate into your life. So, uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of a uh, lot of simple and easy ways people can get started if they just start searching. And then, obviously, uh, we we've been through or continue to be through this pandemic. I don't know what the status is in Sydney right now, whether you're locked up or locked down or locked sideways. I'm not sure where you are, but. Uh, uh, it, this has really tested people, obviously. I mean, it's been the first kind of glo truly global experience, if you think about it, shared global experience. Uh, and uh, people have dealt with it differently. But you, you talk about developing optimism and, and resilience and things like that. And, uh, and obviously, if you have that, uh, you probably weather this more, but they weather, have weathered this better. But moving forward, uh, developing optimism and resilience those these are kind of key traits or key characteristics that you need because we're going to be faced with who knows what in the future and we've seen we've seen what happens when it happens on a, on a large scale like this but but those i think have become even more critical to people's well-being in the future yeah, look, um, look, 100%. It's uh, it's been a difficult, you know, wherever you are, um, it's been a difficult year, well, 18 months, I guess, uh, for, for a lot of us. Um, and I should state that although, um, you know, I'm sometimes known as Dr. Happy, the Chief Happiness Officer of the Happiness Institute, I talk a lot about happiness and positivity. What I also talk a lot about is the absolute importance of being realistic. Um, and so I'm very often saying to people, you know, we can't be happy all the time. No one is happy all the time. Uh, it's okay not to be okay. Uh, and particularly at the moment, you know, over, over the last 12 or 18 months, depending on where you are, obviously it's, it has affected different people differently. And at the moment it will be affecting different people differently. But, um, you know, particularly over the last 18 months, it's even more okay not to be okay. So even though happiness is a wonderful thing to strive towards, even though optimism, as you said, is, uh, well, it's a vitally important strategy, uh, we've got to be realistic. And so at the moment, I would encourage people to accept, or if, they, if they're not okay, to accept that. If they're feeling a bit down, then accept that. That's, you know, that's a normal human re reaction. Um, but at the same time, we don't want to let those things overwhelm us. Um, so, you know, even though it's normal to maybe feel like you're languishing a bit or feel a little bit hopeless, um, there are things we can do to try and pick ourselves up. And it's in our interest. Uh, and everyone around us is in our interest to try to find some hope, try to find some optimism so we can still function as best we can. Because what we know about optimism, um, and this is often you know, misunderstood, I think, is that it's not just positive thinking. Uh, it is about finding positives where they're there, but it's also about finding solutions to negatives. It's solution-focused thinking. And so optimism is not just something for the good times. It's vitally important. It's just as if not more important for the difficult times. So 
at the moment, optimism is more important than ever because it's a way of finding a way out of this, uh, your way out of this. How can you find some hope? How can you focus on what you can do to be the best you can be, even in difficult circumstances? Um, and, you know, that that's actually a really important thing for all of us to be working on in our own way. I mean, my my version of optimistic thoughts at the moment will be a bit different to yours because we're different sure. in different circumstances. But again, I think that the, the simplest way to think about it at the moment is solution finding. What can we do to make things even just a little bit better? Yeah, I, I love, I just wanted to underline what you just said there a moment ago, that optimism, optimism isn't wishful thinking. Uh, sometimes I think people confuse it too. And mm. you, you, can be opt you, you can be optimistic, but you still have to do do things to move yourself forward so it's not optimism in a, in a vacuum it's optimism and action and you know creative thinking all of those at the same time the other thing you mentioned about uh you know not being happy all the time and, and obviously that's that's obvious to some degree but we live in a weird culture now you know popular culture and social media and stuff where it's almost like where it's projected like if you're not happy all the time or you see people like oh i'm not you know i'm not loving like every moment of my job there's something wrong uh, so some of that has become a little skewed i think where the expectation of happiness is 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 a little out of whack Oh, hundred um, percent. And uh, I would stop following those sort of people. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, and it's interesting. I mean, you, you won't find a qualified positive psychologist saying that sort of stuff. Um, you know, anyone mm. with any qualifications or experience in this area will say, you know, yes, positivity is good. You know, yes, let's have as much of it as we can. But um, well, yeah, I mean, if you think about it for a minute, especially given what we've been through recently, but even under any circumstances, if someone literally said to me, they were happy every minute of every day. I'd be concerned. Like, it's just not normal. It's it's bordering on the absurd. Because the flip side, is, it's totally appropriate, totally normal to feel stressed sometimes, to get anxious, to get upset, to even to get angry. I mean, you know, there's some mm -hmm. bad things in the world and, and right. it's appropriate to get angry when certain things happen. So, um, so you know, yes, I, I don't think we should shy away from the fact that um, appropriate positivity and appropriate happiness is a good thing for us. There's a lot of benefits. But it needs to be balanced. And we also need to understand that appropriate sadness is OK. Appropriate anxiety is OK. Um, and so anyone that's sort of not saying that, anyone that's saying you should be happy every minute, you know, I'd question their credentials. I'd question um, you know, the validity of their message. And I'd probably be, stop following them, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. And, and to your point there about the fact that also it's, it's valid to you know, to have stress, it's valid to have to be anxious to me. Uh, but sometimes I think, again, we don't allow that. Uh, we suppress it ourselves a lot. I mean, not just like external suppression, but we suppress it a lot because we don't think it's acceptable to be like that. Oh, definitely. In fact, I just, I've just been, I'm writing a new book at the moment and I just wrote a chapter yesterday, I finished a chapter that focused a lot on that. Um, and you're right, I think a lot of us are brought up, um, and I'm not blaming our parents here, but, but you know, this is just sort of how things happen, I guess. That, yeah. So, for example, if, if, if there are any parents out there, if you have a child who's distressed in any way, what do you do? You try to make them feel better. So this is what, what parents do because they love and they care. They don't want to see their children suffer, so they try to make them feel better. Now, that's not a, obviously not a crazy thing to do, but <laughs> what a lot of us learn for a variety of reasons is that we shouldn't feel upset. Uh, and that if we do feel upset, we should try to fix it as soon as possible. Now, again, that's not a totally crazy idea at all, but it can backfire a bit because what we know from the research is that the more you try to push negative emotions away, the more they push back. The more you try to deny the reality of these very real experiences, the more they fight back. So uh, as well, you know, although there is a role, and this is what I spend a lot of my time doing, there's definitely a role for uh, learning to do what we can to make ourselves feel good as often as possible. There's also a just as if not more important role for learning to accept negative experiences, to allow distress in our lives, to, to as the, the meditation speakers would say, to sit with it, to just be with distress. Now, that's, that's difficult. It's unpleasant. By definition, it's unpleasant. But there's a very important role for doing that, because if we don't, again, those negative emotions can fight back bigger and stronger and harder. And uh, that's not necessarily what any of us want. Yeah, and, and obviously uh, those negative emotions and those stresses and stuff will not just have a mental impact on you, they'll have a physical impact eventually as well. So it's, it's kind of a double negative there. 
Oh yeah, well, and, and they can affect all areas, you know. And they affect our relationships and everything, you know, pretty mm-hmm. much every area of life. If they, especially if they get too 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 big and too dangerous, yeah. Yeah. Well, this has been absolutely uh, fascinating. Uh, again, positive psychology, Dr. Tim Sharp, aka Dr. Happy. All of uh, Dr. Happy's links and uh, information will be below this video. But before we go, Dr. Tim, do please tell people a little bit more about yourself and the Happiness Institute. Sure. Well, thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm uh, here in Sydney, Australia. Um, uh, most of the work I do is that is working with organisations around building positive culture, and uh, well, and at the moment, a lot of it's around building resilience and getting through these difficult times. Um, uh, I think if the links are there, you can find me at drhappy.com.au, or if you're on social media, the Happiness Institute, uh, or Dr Happy on Twitter. So um, uh, come and say hello, and uh, be happy to answer any other questions you have. Yeah, listen, they're great. Thanks again, uh, Dr. Tim. Again, that's Dr. Tim Sharp, Dr. Happy. My name is John Golden. I don't have any moniker, so I'll just go with John Golden. Um, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM, and I'll see you all for another interview really soon. Thank you.